the story of Leland Stanford. The gold rush of 1848 brought to California a 29-year-old lawyer, Leland Stanford, a powerfully built man with strong, heavy features and clear, penetrating eyes, who was born in New York State in 1824. After a few years of storekeeping in the Sierras, young Stanford took over a general store in the new, hustling town of Sacramento. It is a hot July afternoon in 1856. A horny-fisted miner is banging on the counter of Stanford's store. Where's Stanford? Where's Lee Stanford? Where? For the love of... If it isn't old Lizard Bill. Yep. I've been up Dutch Flat doing some prospecting. Uh, where's your tobacco? Oh, it's right here. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That's good tobacco. <laughs> Lee Sanford, you always was a square shooter, always willing to help out a poor busted down cuss when he comes here asking for a grub stick. You uh, need some money, Bill? Money? Me? Well, oh, I didn't know. I didn't I... come here asking you for no money, Sanford. I come here to let you in on a secret. Uh, what kind of a secret? Listen, you know where Grizzly Flat is? Yeah, just beyond Placerville. Well, I got me a claim up there. Yeah, gold is just clamoring to be took up. You gotta use a soft shovel to keep from splitting up the nuggets. It seems to me I have heard that before. I hope to swallow my cud if it ain't true this time. Old Lizard Bill's got a nose for gold. I can sniff it down like a bloodhound and root it up like a hog. Well, what do you need, Bill? Well, I uh, was thinking, if I had a few beans, some vinegar, and a uh, speck of corn tobacco... Well, I guess I can fix you up. Now, remember, I ain't asking you for it. I'm I'm letting you in the, on a business proposition. <laughs> All right, you go over to that clerk, Bill. Tell him to give you whatever you need. Charge it up to me. <laughs> hey, you ain't gonna regret this. Not on your tin type. You'll be rich. Yes, sir. Hey, hey you. Mr. Clark, give me some beans. <laughs> Morning, Stanford. <laughs> Who's your friend over there? Well, hello there, Mark Hopkins. How's the hardware business? Well, if you keep on grub staking miners, it's going to be a lot better than your store. Oh, you mean Bill? Well, there's always a chance that he might make a strike, you know. Oh, you've done the same thing yourself. How about the union mine? Hanford and Downs owe us both plenty for supplies and yes, equipment. I wanted to talk to you about that. Uh, I'm afraid they're going into bankruptcy. Well, that mine isn't paying. Oh, strange. I heard that the union was a profitable mine. Oh, bad management. Now, if I owned that mine, I'd give Sam Hanford complete control. He knows how to let those other owners. <laughs> they're the ones that ruined it. You uh, say the mine's going into bankruptcy. Absolutely. Hmm? Mark, take a look at these books. Well, say... What did you lend these fellas? If they go into bankruptcy, I'll be the largest creditor. I'll own control of this mine. I believe you will. And if you are smart, you'll hang on to that interest. Put Sam Hanford in complete charge and you'll make it pay. Well, I'll take a chance on it. You know, I figured that if you help these miners along, they'll help you. Why, even old Bill, he's about to turn up one of these days loaded with gold. And all I gave him was a few supplies. It pays to take chances, Mark. It doesn't cost much... But it pays. By financing worthy miners, Stanford never stopped below four hundred thousand dollars. As years passed, Leland Stanford became influential, famous, and the new governor of Galloway. Comes to let him down the east, Stanford devoted his attention to a project of peace, the project of bridging a nation. We find him at his office in the state capitol, conversing with his friend, Mark Hopkins, the hardware merchant. Now, you and I know the danger, Mark. President, the time may come when California will cede from the Union, as the southern states are trying to do now. Yes, it's true. Thank you, Mr. Miller, apart. We've heard a lot of talk about setting up an independent Western Republic. Now, the only way to squash that talk is to build a railroad. A railroad, yes, but not a very possible one. Now, how would you build a road across the mountain? Why, those winter snows? Oh, I know, I know. That's been an argument for years. But I had a man named Judah yesterday. That Theodore Judah? <laughs> but he's gone mad on the idea of a transcontinental railroad. Well, I don't think he's so crazy. In fact, I intend to help him put that road through. Or well, Stanford, you can't be now, serious. Judah has been prospecting around the mountains for years. Not for gold, but for a good railroad route. Now, he says there's a long, easy grade up by Dutch Flat. Now, wait a minute. Are you going to support this railroad as governor or finance it with your own money? Well, with my own money, of course. <laughs> and uh, with your money, too, Mark, if you want to go in on it. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll talk the matter over with my partner, Huntington. 
We can probably advance this man, Judah, enough money to make a complete survey of those mountains. Good. Not that I put much faith in that railroad idea now, but it, it might be practical. You never can tell. No, you... you never can tell. Newspapers jeered the idea. Engineers scoffed. Doggedly, Stanford went on, plunging himself into debt. Finally, on the 8th of January, 1863, a band of pioneers gathered on the rain-swollen levee of the Sacramento. Among them, the governor and his wife, Jane Lathrop Stanford. Leland, it's beginning to rain again. Well, perhaps you'd better stay here in the carriage. And miss this ceremony? No, darling. This is going to be one of the proudest days of my life. Well, looks like a very gloomy day. Oh, you haven't forgotten your speech. No, no, Jenny. We'd better hurry to the speaker's platform before we get drenched. Yes. It's very discouraging. Uh, this weather, I mean. Oh, don't be discouraged about the railroad, dear. Things begun in bad weather usually end in sunshine. Mm, well, I hope so. And here's the platform. These steps are slippery. Here, put it onto my arm. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to present His Excellency, Governor Sanford, who will address you. And so, in conclusion, it is to realize all this that we are assembled here today. And we should be happy in the enjoyment of so great and glorious a privilege. I feel honored that ground for the Central Pacific Railroad is first broken by my hand. And may we have God's blessing upon this undertaking. The governor of the state of California will now shovel the first earth for the great Central Pacific Railroad. While shivering spectators stand ankle-deep in water, Leland Stanford sinks her shovel into the wet earth. The gray sky weeps. A scoop of dripping mud splatters the embankment. The Central Pacific Railroad is born. A line of shining rails crawls over the wrinkled Sierra. From another direction, the Union Pacific fights its way through the Rockies. Engines puff across plains thick with buffalo. The clang of hammers, the whoop of marauding Indians, Chinese coolies sweating in the sun, the courage of Leland Sanford. All this made a railroad, and the railroad welded an empire. But during the excitement, the feverish activity of empire building, another event took place in the Stanford home. Don't make any noise, dear. He's asleep. Oh, you're all right, Jenny? Oh, of course. It's a boy, Leland. You wanted a boy, didn't you? More than anything else. The Lord's been good to us, Jane. Oh, here. Let me take a look at him. <laughs> we'll call him Leland Stanford, Jr. A boy. completed, Stanford devoted the next 15 years to the education of his son. His fortune increased with every wheel that rolled over the Central Pacific's tracks. He purchased bountiful farmlands in the Santa Clara Valley, vineyards, and more railroads. This was to be the heritage of Leland Stanford, Jr. But fate has no regard for the plans of men, and Stanford's only son died at the age of 15. Soon after... A lonely, careworn couple paid a visit to President Elliott of Harvard University. Now, as I understand it, Mr. Stanford, you're contemplating the founding of a university. That's why we came to you. How much would it cost to build a school out in California? Uh, one like Harvard or, or Cornell? In California, eh? Well, I own a large farm out there uh, where my son was raised. And Jenny and I wanted to be a memorial to him. It's a beautiful place. Our boy loved it so. 
And we thought that other young people might appreciate it. Now, just how much would it cost, Miss Levitt, a, a good substantial endowment? Well, you couldn't think of doing it for less than five million. A fool like Harvard would cost you about twenty-five million. Mm, I see. You understand, the university isn't built entirely of brick and cement. It's the men in back of account. Well, that's a theory I followed when I was building railroads. In principle, this isn't much different. I'm very glad to help you in any way possible. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll just keep in touch with you in case there's anything more we want to know. Well, good day, Mr. Elliott. Good day to you both, and uh, come back again. We shall. Goodbye. Leland, what do you think about it? I made up my mind a long time ago. We can afford to give five million to a good cause like this, can't we? Why, yes. Money doesn't mean much now. It can't buy back the thing we loved most. No. But it can bring light and happiness to others. It can and will. Five million dollars. Why, that isn't enough. Our university is going to start with 30 million. $30 million. Hard earned dollars collected from Stanford's general store, from his mines and railroads. All of Stanford's fortune went into the founding of a university. Few today remember that Leland Stanford hammered down the golden spike which linked the continent. Few remember him as the wartime governor of California. But the school, named for his son, perpetuates his desire for world enlightenment and true American progress. All tribute to the one-time owner of the Palo Alto farm, where today the winds of freedom blow. Leland Stanford, Captain of Industry. <laughs> <laughs>